Okay, we will continue with the second talk of uh, Professor White uh, about non-linearity. <laughs> Okay, so in the last lecture I spent a bit of time talking about how one might formally go about developing a method for dealing with nonlinearity in the case where we're almost linear but not quite, we wanted to do a relatively high precision calculation, uh, so the not quite became important. So to sort of make that a little bit more concrete and give a specific example of that, I wanted to spend a bit of time today um, talking about how you can apply some of these techniques to studying baryonic acoustic oscillations. Uh, and I wasn't entirely sure how many people were familiar with baryonic acoustic oscillations and how many people <coughs> heard it all before and never heard it before. So I'm going to spend just a couple of slides rapidly going through the background of theory of baryonic acoustic oscillations and sort of the idea behind the method, but like and fast, so that way half of you will be bored and half of you will be lost and I will have accomplished my mission. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how one can use uh, perturbation theory and learn something about uh, what nonlinearities might do to baryonic acoustic oscillations. So um, we're all very, very familiar with baryonic acoustic oscillations uh, in the photon baryon fluid from looking at the photons. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, plot that one is required contractually to show if one has a uh, position in cosmology, uh, showing the, you know, the angular power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background temperature and isotropies. Uh, along with a bunch of data, uh, once again showing that the theorists are really smart uh, and are always correct. Um, what you can see in, in this series of, uh, of, of features in the CMB angular power spectrum is this series of peaks that arise due to these sound waves traveling uh, through the early universe. Right? And so we understand that this peak comes from the, the first time the baryon photon fluid comes inside the horizon, becomes a compression. Here is the, the first peak uh, due to the, the, uh, the rarefaction, compression, rarefaction, and so on. So I'm assuming that everyone's familiar with this physics. Uh, and I'm not going to go into uh, you know, all of the details of that. We, we heard about that uh, just previously and, and a, a, a day or two ago. What I want to point out is that these peaks occur when k times the speed of sound times the age of the universe of last scattering is pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, and so on. And so this spectrum has a characteristic scale, in this case a characteristic angular scale, but that scale is set by the sound horizon, which is basically the speed of sound times the age of the universe at last scattering. And so basic, more or less, atomic physics plus gravity sets a scale which is imprinted for the distribution of photons and, of course, of, uh, in, in the matter uh, back at the, the surface of last scattering. And this scale is pretty well determined. I haven't actually updated this for the latest value because it's already getting kind of ridiculously good. But this sound horizon turns out to be about 147 megaparsecs. Notice there's no h in here. This is kind of an actual unit. Uh, you know, in SI units, it's this many meters. Um, and this error bar is no longer dominated by how well you can actually you know, centroid any one of those features in L. It's really dominated by the fact that we don't actually understand the expansion rate particularly well back at the surface of last scattering. You know, we have this massive error of you know, percents uh, that we don't understand there. And this basically comes from the fact that we don't have particularly brilliant constraints near the third peak, uh, and so we can't actually get at the, the potential envelope very well. Uh, I'll just point out in passing, because I'm on the plank, that Planck will absolutely nail this, and so this will become yet another you know, well-known <coughs> cosmological number that you just look up. Just as a pop quiz, I'm not going to ask for the answer, but for something to think about while I, when you tune out while I'm speaking here. Um, we always talk about precision cosmology. Ask yourself how many cosmological parameters are known better than a percent, and what they're all from. So that's an interesting question. This is almost at a percent level, so we know this, this number fairly well. So the interesting piece of physics then is that you know, the baryons contribute roughly 15% of the total matter density, 
So the total gravitational potential is affected by those acoustic oscillations that are happening in the baryon photon fluid. Um, this leads to small oscillations in the matter power spectrum, not the kind of order unity changes in power that we saw in the CMB spectrum. They're suppressed by a factor of omega v over omega m, which is roughly a tenth. So you expect to see of order 10% fluctuations in the matter power spectrum. Just a, a sort of note that sometimes people get a little bit confused about. All of the matter sees these acoustic oscillations because the baryons contribute to the potential and the dark matter responds to the potential. So some people think, you know, somehow the dark matter is, is you know, not seeing the baryon acoustic oscillations. Um, but all of this, the entire matter power spectrum sees this. And so this just plots, uh, you know, versus K, this is the angular power spectrum of the radiation. And this is of the matter where I've you know, inserted appropriate K's to make these two things look roughly similar. And what you can see is that, you know, whatever mechanism is setting this particular scale is clearly the same mechanism as setting this scale. These are damping around at the same rate. They clearly have uh, very, very related physics. So if I divide out that smooth trend so I can focus in, these are the wiggles that we see, roughly 10% amplitude, as I promised, uh, damped at high K, so a damped almost harmonic sequence of wiggles in the power spectrum of the mass perturbations, whose scale, I argue, we, we know uh, really rather precisely. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about configuration space, and you know, it's, it's always a bad idea to Fourier transform in public, but let me do it for you just once. Um, so I want to calculate the correlation function here, which is just the Fourier transform of the power spectrum. If that was a perfectly harmonic series of peaks, that Fourier transform would be a delta function, right? Fourier transform of the sine wave is just a delta function. It's not exactly a harmonic series, and there is that damping. And so if I just plot the correlation function, that series of wiggles becomes a single peak with a width of roughly 10 megaparsecs that's set by the still damping scale um, at, at roughly 100 megaparsecs over H, so roughly the sound horizon. And so often we refer to the acoustic feature. Uh, that can mean either this bump or that series of wiggles. Uh, it can mean either. Um, so the interesting question and the thing I want to talk about today, assuming that we all understand the linear theory of this extraordinarily well, is what effects does nonlinearity non have on varying acoustic oscillation? Right? Because that, that's the topic of my lectures. And there's basically three effects, and I want to take you through them a little bit. Uh, Nonlinearity is going to generate sort of excess high K power, excess small scale power as things. Was the battery maker that's the wave number or angle physical space? Because Sorry. see a big boss and say 450. This guy's in, well, I don't know if this is actual physical space because it's an ancient here and stuff, but yes. yeah, this is a peak at 100 megaparsecs. Yeah. Over H. Over H, so that, you know, there's 147 versus 100. You know, this. But, but these are actually. In big blocks, the scale is the form mega parsecs. The peaks are the 107 hundreds of each in those mega parsecs, mm -hmm. okay. which is the 147 of the H. Mm -hmm. And there's a factor due to the fact that you've got to integrate against J0. But. Okay, so as things collapse, of course, and become extremely nonlinear, right? Uh, you're generating a lot of power on small scale. So we expect to see excess power, where excess means over the linear theory prediction uh, at high K or at small scales. That will reduce the contrast of the wiggles just by the fact that I have some 10% wiggle and then I increase the DC level, the contrast will go down. Uh, it will damp the oscillations, and we've already seen why that will happen, but I'll take you through that again. Uh, and as we'll see, it will generate an out of phase component. So if I'm thinking in Fourier space, these are the three effects. Uh, that will happen when I have nonlinearity. We'll walk through each of these uh, over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. If I do this not in Fourier space, but in configuration space, then I, I still generate excess small-scale power, right? When, when I form these highly dense objects, halos, galaxies, clusters, and so on, that they will have over densities approaching you know, 10 to the 5 in their, in their centers, um, and so I'll get a lot of small-scale power. <coughs> Damping the oscillations is the same thing as broadening the peak, right? If I, multiply in Fourier space, I convolve in, in real space, uh, and so convolving a peak with some broad thing will broaden out the peak. And generating an out-of-phase component is the same thing as shifting the actual centroid of those peaks. So whichever way you want to think about it, these are the sort of three effects that we want to investigate. And this generation of excess power is, is almost trivial, so, uh, so we won't spend much time on that. We'll concentrate on the other two. So this just shows what I said uh, in pictures. So that's a thousand words each to two thousand words on there plus these. Um, this shows it in Fourier space versus K, again with a linear K axis 
looking at. Here it is in configuration space, and this is all theoretical. Um, the points are an in-body simulation, the uh, model I'll come back to in a little while, and the blue line is the linear theory. And so you can see here that the, the contrast of these oscillations is clearly going away. I clearly see this excess small-scale power that's being generated. Uh, it's very hard to see the out-of-phase component in here because it's about half a percent shift in phase, uh, but we'll come back and see that in a little second. Uh, and here's the same thing in configuration space. You can clearly see this peak is broader than that one. That's the same thing as these things being damped. You can't really tell that it's shifted apart from the fact that it's broadened. The peak is asymmetric, so once I broaden it, I shift it, but I mean shifts above and beyond that. Uh, there's a half a percent shift there, which of course is probably the thickness of that line, so you can't see it visually, uh, but we'll come back. And then the model again, you can see, is more or less passing through the in-body data. So, um, I claim we already understand the generation of small-scale power, and in fact we understand the broadening, because you'll remember last lecture, we will all remember this of course, uh, we had the, the power spectrum in Lagrangian perturbation theory or renormalized perturbation theory or the peak background split looks like e to the minus k squared sigma squared times p linear plus a bunch of stuff, right? So that is a multiplication in Fourier space that is giving me a damping of the, the linear theory, a damping of the oscillations. That, that becomes a convolution in real space. So we understand what's causing that. We understand what that broadening is due to. We understand how it evolves with time. We understand what I want to talk about is what happens to anything else. Does anything else happen? Is it just simply that broadening, or is there, is there more information? Um, so the idea would be that we're going to try and fit for the position of this acoustic feature. We're going to allow variations in a number of other things, for example, in the broadband shape, because, for example, I may believe that biasing may be scale dependent, or there may be something else interesting happening. So I'm imagining fitting some kind of functional form, piece of fit, which schematically looks like the, the wiggly linear theory power spectrum that I had, some kind of template here, with a possible parameter alpha, which indicates the shift, right? So if alpha was one, that would be kind of the cosmology I want, but I'm allowing it to slide back and forth in K space uh, to say that my distance measure could be wrong, for example. I'm allowing a lot of small scale power to come in, and I'm allowing the, there to be some smooth modulation of linear theory. So this is almost the most general thing I could write down, of course, but B and A arbitrary, this, this would be, you know, fit anything. But I'm going to imagine that B and K are, B and A are relatively smooth functions of K. So these could either be constants, splines, polynomials, party approximants, whatever you like, as long as it's smooth, as long as it's not got enough freedom in it that it can fit out wiggles, right? That, that would be where you would get into trouble. Alpha is measuring the shift relative to some fiducial cosmology. We do have some clue as to what we're looking for after all. Uh, and this template. Uh, I'm going to take to be this kind of Gaussian suppression times the linear theory, and you'll notice that the linear theory is scaled by this k over alpha, right? And so if I move things to smaller scales, I would expect alpha to be greater than 1, for example. And I could take sigma to be a free parameter, uh, or I could put in a prior, or I could just take the perturbation theory, uh, and different authors disagree on exactly what you want to do. And so the question is, if I were to fit this, how well would I do, right? Would I get the right answer? Would I get you know, alpha equals 1? Uh, and I'm going to take you through an argument that appeared in this paper. Uh, there are similar arguments elsewhere in the literature, and I, I can refer you to those, but let me run you through this one, because it's the one I'm most familiar with. One of the great things about baryon acoustic oscillations is that they occur out at 100 megaparsecs, where things are incredibly linear. And that means that these shifts you're looking for are incredibly small, right? So the first thing you, you realize is that there are almost uh, no major systematics in this method, and that's a disaster when you're looking for systematics, right? Because it's really hard to find them. Uh, so, what we decided to do, since we're looking for such a small shift, and you're worried about you know, just finding numerical errors in your simulations, was to work with that crazy cosmology, and I put crazy in quotes because this used to be the cosmology uh, to first approximation, but you know, nowadays it's completely insane. Um, so it's got omega matter of one, right? Uh, omega baryon of 40, this is, this is actually pretty big, but 40%, you know, so I can really crank out the effect of baryons. H of a half, that again used to be something people believed in. Uh, N is one because you know N had to be one, and sigma is one because it's a number of what unity, right? Uh, so, so if you look at this cosmology, it turns out that the sound horizon is not 100 megaparsecs but 50 megaparsecs, and that that's quite a big shift. Uh, obviously, that does a couple of things for us. First of all, in any given simulation volume, there's eight times more realizations of that scale than there are at the 100 megaparsec scale. So all your error bars go down by a factor of root 8 without doing any work. 
But for output, this is the interesting thing is I've moved this to smaller scales and I've got a fairly <coughs> high normalization. And so I've really cranked up the effect of nonlinearity on the acoustic scale, and that means I can actually go out and measure shifts. And so here is a function of redshift is alpha minus one <coughs> listed in percent. And you can see it grows from just under a percent up to about 3%. Uh, and these error bars are from a series of simulations. So these are sort of numerical realization noise. Um, and we want to understand, right, we have these big, big shifts, because we've very carefully you know, done this in a crazy cosmology. We can now measure these shifts. You can see they're measured relatively well. What's causing them, right? So I've already ruled out the null hypothesis that the peak does not shift. But what's causing these? Um, if you plot them, you get some feeling for what might be going on. Here is alpha minus 1 measured in percent as a function of redshift. And you can see these points with the error bars. And this line says that alpha minus 1 is proportional to the growth factor squared. So that certainly looks as though one should be looking for terms scaling as d squared, right? Which just conveniently happens to be <coughs> the scaling of the second order corrections and perturbation theory. So you think to yourself, wow, you know, we're really onto something here. Um, so you recall, of course, that in uh, perturbation theory, I'm taking delta and I'm writing it as a first order term plus a second order term, etc. So when I take my power spectrum, it sort of factorizes into two types of terms. There's P11, P13, P15, etc. Then there's terms that go like P22, P44, and so on, right? So I'm going to divide these terms schematically into terms that look like P1n and Pmn. Right? And in the simulations, if not in, in observations, I can isolate these two types of terms by considering the cross spectrum of the final field with the initial field, or by considering the fully evolved field. Right? So I can actually measure these two things in a simulation uh, independently. And so if I go and I take not the dark matter cross with itself, but the dark matter cross with the initial density field of the simulation, which I very cleverly stored, you'll notice that these shifts are extremely small and basically consistent uh, with no shift at all. And so that says that the, the shifts in the cross spectrum, which are these P1n terms, are an order of magnitude smaller than the shifts in the auto spectrum. Why might that have been expected? If you go and actually look at what these P1n terms look like, they all look like linear theory things times integrals of PL times M. These integrals are integrals of a weakly function times a fairly broad kernel. So this is a smooth thing. It's a fairly complicated expression, but it's a relatively smooth function. And so I've just renormalized the coefficient in front of PL. And in fact, some of these integrals, pieces of these integrals, are what get resummed up into that exponential prefect. So the P1n is partly responsible for the broadening of the peak, but it's not doing anything for the shift, right? And so we've demonstrated that numerically, but you can also kind of understand it uh, in perturbation theory. So what about these other terms? And another one of these horrible nomenclature things, these other terms are frequently referred to as mode coupling terms, even though all of the terms are mode coupling terms. So that way we've carefully isolated the, the fundamental difference between mode coupling terms and mode coupling terms. Um, so these P1n terms are benign, I claim. But these Pmn terms are actually the problem. And we can see this pretty easily because these PMN terms involve integrals of products of PL times the kernel, right? So P22, for example, is P linear times P linear times this F2. Now, you will remember, because I told you to, that F2 is sharply peaked when its two arguments are both half K. Let me imagine that it was so sharply peaked it was a delta function, right? So I can now do this integral trivially. This PL, PL term is going to contain an out of phase oscillation. So let's see how that works. Suppose PL is a whole bunch of stuff plus for simplicity, something nice and simple that's just sine kr. Then pl times pl times f2 is going to be a whole bunch of stuff times sine squared kr over 2. But using trig identities, that's 1 plus cosine kr. Right? So I would expect that this integral is going to contain a piece that looks like the derivative of whatever signal is actually in the underlying linear theory. And so since cosine x is d by dx of sine x, and I can always tailor expand pk alpha as p of k minus alpha minus 1 dp log k, right? If I generate a term that looks like this derivative, that's the same thing as shifting the peak. Right? So an out of phase component is the same thing as a peak shift. So you could ask, well, this is a kind of hooky argument. Uh, how, how well does it actually do? So if you go out and you actually calculate uh, p22, uh, you get this uh, you know, series of points here. And if you ask, 
What is minus 0374 times P11 prime? That's this dashed line. And so you can see that you know, that interval is actually pretty sharply peaked. And, and you, know, you get a whole bunch of other terms, but you do generate this out of phase component. And so up to this overall factor of 0.0374, this mode coupling term, or at least a piece of this mode coupling term, is actually quite well approximated by the PD log K, and that explains why we're seeing these shifts. So you can then make use of that and say, okay, well, what happens if I fit not this functional form, which I had previously, but I add in the fact that I know that there's a P22, right? So suppose I add this in, but still fit for alpha, right? So if I was correct, alpha should now be one, because I would have taken out that shift, at least you know, to first order, perturbatively. And you can see that that's actually, uh, roughly speaking, true. You know, the error bars are not as small as one would like, necessarily. Uh, but these shifts are clearly much, much smaller than these shifts. And so I've taken out the majority of what's going on. This P22 uh, is actually what's causing that shift. So this template, then, would return an unbiased estimate of the sound scale. Unfortunately, that has all been done assuming just that I'm measuring the amount of house. But I'm not, of course. I'm measuring some bias tracer of that, for example, I could be measuring galaxies. So in order to remove the shift, I need to know the relative amplitude of P11 and P22, right? It's that relative amplitude that, that is telling me alpha minus one on the shift. For the mass, that's completely known. It's relative amplitude of P11 and P22. But what do I do if I have bias traces? So you can do this in either the Eulerian or Lagrangian pictures. You get very similar results. Let me just write out some formula to show you. Um, you know, the halo power spectrum ends up with some kind of bias squared times a bunch of matter pieces. You know, there's a lot of dot, dot, dot that I'm dropping here, but, but these two terms. And then there's these uh, terms involving these Q integrals, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a little while, that have terms that go as the first order bias and the second order bias. Remember I said we take delta galaxy or delta halo and Taylor series expand it as a function of delta matter. The Lagrangian case, uh, you get a sort of a similar looking expression. You have some terms involving P11 plus some terms in front of P22. Notice where the bias factors go is a little different in the two of them. And then you get these various other terms. And all of these uh, have known expressions. This is what the QNs look like. Uh, and this is just taken from Matsubara's paper. Um, you can find similar things in Eulerian perturbation theory. They're all of the form integral of P times integral of P times some coupling kernel, uh, and all of the coupling kernels are written out here. As you can see, there's 13 of them. Uh, most of them are fairly benign, but some of them do interesting things. And if you ask, what are those combinations that, that I showed you in those previous expressions, what do they look like? Well, you know, there's one that's 998 Q1 plus 37 Q2. This is my favorite prefect at 998. Isn't that great? Uh, and so this shows you there's a, a points on here. Uh, we show you that. There's the, the derivative is on there. You can't see it. It's almost directly on top. And then this is the P linear thing. So you can see that these guys are clearly out of phase. Uh, here's it's the same thing for 6 7 Q5 plus 2 Q7. And uh, here it is with 3 7 Q5 plus Q9. And here you can actually see the blue line, which is the derivative. Uh, is, is not exactly matching this thing. But still, it's a pretty good match. So all of these terms that come in, right? So you, there's a whole bunch of terms, and I haven't even written them all out. Uh, but all of these terms that come in, you know, 6, 7, Q5, plus 2, Q7, and so on, all of those terms that come in contain things that are either in phase or things that are basically out of phase. And so pretty much all of these combinations that come in are pretty well approximated by the log derivative of P11. And all of those terms can therefore effectively be written as some exponential damping, some sum of terms that multiply PL, and some sum of different terms that multiply P22. So all I need to do now is work out the relative ratios of P2 and P1, right? But I know these expressions, so I know what coefficients give all of those scalings. So you get a relatively simple model that explains this B1, B2 relation that turns out to be true for a variety of cosmologies pretty much all the ones we tested, including Lambda CDM, you can measure it from simulations. And this is where you have to kind of get a little bit clever. You want to take various powers of your initial density field and various powers of your final density field that isolate all of those terms. And all of those can be measured in simulations and extrapolated in nice ways. Um, and so you can actually go in and measure this B1, B2 relation. And then, of course, the shift that you're expecting is going to grow as d squared, and it's going to depend on this ratio of b2 to b1. And if you calculate the free factor for lambda CDM, which is the case of interest, so let's drop considering crazy CDM. For lambda CDM, alpha minus 1 turns out to be pretty close to a half a percent times this growth factor squared times this ratio of b2 over b1. 
So if I plot this alpha minus 1 as a function of the galaxy bias, uh, then I get the following curves. And these are all at redshift 0, so you should scale them down by the growth factor squared, uh, but this shows you sort of the largest effect. So the dotted line is just what happens if I do halos of a particular mass. So if I want to ask, if I somehow isolated halos of some particular mass, in this case I think it was 10 to the 12 and a half or so, um, you know, as a function of the galaxy, so you know, here it would be 10 to 12 and a half or so, um, you know, you get, you get this curve. If I took all halos above M, so let's just say galaxies of a certain luminosity live in halos more massive than something, then the bias shifts up a little bit because the more massive halos are slightly more biased. Uh, and then if I take some kind of thing where I say the number of galaxies uh, looks like one above some threshold, but then there's satellite galaxies above some other threshold, so some kind of simple HOD model, then it's slightly more biased. You can see these are all around sort of a percent times d squared for things that are biased of order 2 or so. Now, the important thing to take away from this plot, right, is that it's not this number that really matters. This is the bias I know about, right? I can take this bias out. That was the whole point of doing this calculation. So it's the uncertainty in this bias that is the actual error that I worry about. And so you can go through uh, and you can convince yourself, I mean, it's almost a tautology, I guess, in some sense. You can measure these things and, and different models predict differences in these kinds of things. You can measure them to about the 10% level. So that means the uncertainty in this number is roughly 10% of the number itself. So I started with numbers that are water kind of a half to 1%. That means the uncertainty is somewhere in the range 0.05 to 0.1%. Right? And at that level, there's lots of other uncertainties that don't come just from nonlinearity that are kind of swept under the rug here. Uh, but the understanding of what happens due to nonlinear structure formation uh, is, is relatively Um, everything I did there was in real space. You can do exactly the same thing in redshift space, not in all their perturbation theory as easily, but in this resum to Lagrangian perturbation theory that Matsubara has developed. You can go in and do redshift space power spectrum for bias traces. Uh, and you can calculate the various moments of this. You find quite a similar story. I won't drag you through all the terms. There's many, many more of them now. You now find that these scaling coefficients that go in depend on this f. So the expressions become more complex. That's a code word. Um, but the structure is largely unchanged, right? So you can, you can run through more or less the same argument. The amplitude of the shift goes up a little bit. It's about 30% or so that it goes up. But you're still talking numbers that are of order 10 to the minus 3 uh, in terms of the final uncertainty. So there's a large literature on this. As I said, um, you know, there's been a huge um, resurgence in perturbation theory driven partly by this VAO problem, partly by, by redshift space distortions, and we'll hear a little bit about that cycle later on today, I think. Um, so, you know, the first use of perturbation theory uh, to study BAO goes back, you know, before BAO was even really, you know, a hot topic. Uh, we use standard perturbation theory back before the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, then there was this kind of big uh, resurgence of interest in perturbation theory and lots of very clever ways of resumming them and, and, and trying new methods. Um, starting around sort of 2006, 2007, going into 2008, and I list some of these papers here, they will get you started at least, and they cross-reference each other to some extent, so you can kind of get going. I spoke a lot about Matsubaras, there's a very nice work of Kotre and Scott Jamara using this renormalized perturbation theory, uh, and, and various generalizations of that, and there's a bunch of papers I haven't listed here, but this will get you going. Um, John Komatsu talking about doing this at high, uh, high redshift. Uh, these are various resummation schemes that have come in. Uh, this is the stuff I was talking about. Uh, and then there's, uh, there's a group in Japan that's been very, very active using uh, some methods that we'll hear about later today. Uh, so there's some places you can go uh, and look for further reading on this topic. Um, I want to do something a little bit different, though. I mean, we could have gone and measured these shifts in n-body simulations and taken a purely engineering approach and said, you know, I really want to understand anything. I just want to measure it. Um, so let me just run a large number of simulations, and the computer will know the answer, and it will tell me. And you know, computers are fantastic at generating numbers, so I'll generate a table of numbers, uh, and then I'll use that to correct my data. Right? I'm probably going to be doing that with my data anyway, because I'll have mock catalogs and window functions and redshift incompleteness and all kinds of other things. So let me just throw that all into the mix. Right? Um, and you know, that's probably an okay approach. We I mean, engineers we build bridges, and we drive over them every day, and we don't worry about the fact that we don't understand them seems to stand up, that's mostly, that's okay. Um, 
So one of the things that these kind of analytic methods are really useful for, though, is not generating numbers so much as generating understanding. And so I want to give you an example uh, of where this kind of way of thinking about a particular Lagrangian perturbation theory uh, does help you think a little bit about what's going on in some of these kind of complicated schemes that we come up with for massaging data. Uh, and so just as a case example, um, I want to talk about reconstruction. So reconstruction is a, is a technique uh, originally introduced by these authors uh, several years ago now to try and undo the effects of this nonlinearity. And it's actually quite, an, quite a clever idea. So remember that the effect of this nonlinearity was to broaden and slightly shift the acoustic peak. And in perturbation theory, although uh, it's probably only true asymptotically, the broadening is equal to the Zoldovich displacement. So if you go and do that integral that gives you the Zoldovich displacement, you find that a lot of that broadening comes from quite large scales. But those are exactly the scales that you've gone and measured when you've done your galaxy survey. So you know, in some sense, what did the broadening. And so there was this idea, maybe you could undo or reconstruct the initial unbroadened feature. It's obviously much more easy to centroid a narrow feature than a broad one. So if you could do this, your statistical precision will go up. Um, and so what I wanted to do is ask the question, what does this procedure do? Because as I'll, I'll run through the procedure in just a second, uh, it's not entirely clear that what you're doing is really reconstructing the initial conditions. You're doing some sort of hybrid thing uh, that's a little hard to understand. But we'll see that Lagrangian perturbation theory is, is really nice in doing this. So this just makes quantitatively the point that I, I said in words. If I plot the contribution to this broadening from scales less than k, so larger scales than k, uh, compared to its asymptotic value, as a function of k, you can see that you know, half of the broadening comes from scales larger than tens of megaparsecs, which I imagine I should be able to model maybe with linear perturbation theory, and I imagine uh, that I've measured very, very well in my simulation, right? only in my observation. So here's the reconstruction procedure, and it, it makes some kind of sense. I take my density field and I smooth it uh, by convolving it with some smoothing kernel, so I've got that here in Fourier space. And so imagine this S of k, for example, is a Gaussian. And that's to get rid of all the nonlinear stuff I can't model. Then I go in and I compute the negative of the Zoldovich displacement, which I'm going to call S, from this smooth field. So S just looks like taking my smooth field, calculating using the Zoldovich approximation how far it would have gone in linear theory, and moving that back. So if this was perfect linear theory, I've now undone all the clustering that I started with. So I shift all the particles by this displacement to generate what's known as a displaced field, delta subdisplaced. And in linear theory, this displaced field has no perturbations anymore, right? Now, of course, real life is not linear, so there will still be some, but hopefully the large scale stuff goes away. Then I take a spatially uniform grid of points or some random distribution of points, and I also shift it by S, and that gives me the shifted field. So if everything were purely linear, what I've done is I've moved all of the perturbations out of the displaced field, and I put them into the shifted field, which has negative density, everywhere the actual field had positive density. And then I define the reconstructed field as the difference between the displaced and the shifted fields. So in linear theory, that's delta. Right? I've done nothing. And the idea is that this is a very good thing to do uh, if, if I have nonlinear stuff. Um, just as a note for some of these equations that come a little bit later on, if you want to kind of take a sanity check when you're looking at the equations, if I take uh, S to zero, that's equivalent to doing no reconstruction at all, because I've taken this field to zero and the shift goes linearly with S there. So if you want to just check that you regain your intuition. So here's what happens in pictures. Uh, this is taken from a simulation. It's a slice. The color code is the density field, log of the density field. So this shows the initial conditions. This shows the final structure, and this is heavily smooth to try and emphasize the large scale structure, not the actual small halos. So you can see here, this is in megaparsecs. This is 600, 700, 800. So these blobs are large superclusters of objects. And then this shows you the reconstructed field. And you can see you know, the peaks are in the same place here. But notice you know, the density contrast here was quite high, and it's been reduced. So this is clearly much closer to these initial conditions than the final field that I simply started with. Right? So the final field has much sharper, more pronounced peaks than either the initial or the reconstructed density field. So it's clearly doing something to undo the nonlinearity. It's doing something correct. And if you actually go and take the correlation functions there and do this statistically, um, you know, here's my original linear theory correlation function. Here's what happens if I measure it from the simulation. It's very, very broad in this particular case. 
And then here is if I do reconstruction, smoothing the either with a Gaussian of 5 megaparsecs or a Gaussian of 10 megaparsecs, just to show it doesn't matter very much. And you can see that it's certainly gotten a lot narrower than I started with. So I've clearly moved some of the way towards, uh, towards reconstructing the peak. It would be much easier to find and centroid this peak than this one. Uh, but I haven't gotten all the way, and that's probably because I had to smooth the field, and so you know, there was some nonlinear information loss. But what have I done when I've differenced these fields, right? Where, where's the signal gone? I kind of move this around in a complicated way. And for many months, a whole number of us would sit in front of the blackboard and come up with increasingly bizarre schemes to try and figure out what the hell we've done and, and manage to confuse ourselves right royally. Um, but it turns out Lagrangian perturbation theory is a wonderful way of dealing with this because remember, Zoldovich approximation is first order Lagrangian perturbation theory, and I'm shifting all of these things around using the Zoldovich approximation. So that kind of argues that one should do a perturbation theory analysis. So you remember that my density contrast looked like the Fourier transform of e to the ik psi, where this was my displacement. So if I ask, well, what happens now when I go through this whole procedure, I have displaced fields and shifted fields and so on. The displaced field is now generated not by psi, but by psi plus the shifts. The shifted field is generated just by the shifts. That's kind of a tautology in some sense, I guess. And if you just run through it, you can convince yourself very quickly that to lowest order, delta reconstruction is delta linear. So the first order in perturbation theory does exactly what I claimed it should do. But you can do it through and you can calculate the next order correction as well. And if you just calculate the second order correction in the reconstructed field, you'll find the following expression. So notice if I take the s's to zero and do no reconstruction, the reconstructed field becomes the true second order field. Notice this expression involves only terms of lower order than this one. So this reconstructed field contains second order corrections. Prove that that's true order by order. So you've definitely not reconstructed the initial theories. So you've done something, you've reconstructed something, but it's not your initial conditions. So why did it work? Right? I mean, this is good, but it's not linear theory. So what have, what have I done? So in order to illustrate this, you can run through the whole calculation and just write it out. But in order to illustrate what's going on, I just want to do a toy model which isolates the main pieces. So let's, uh, let's imagine this is often referred to as the peak background split. Let me, let me imagine that my psi has two contributions, one from long, low frequency modes and one from high frequency modes. And I'm going to assume that they're both Gaussian to make my life easy. In real life, of course, they won't be. Uh, and that they're completely uncorrelated. And I'm going to assume that this low frequency shifts are all generated by linear theory and that the high frequency piece is just noise. It doesn't contain any BAO features. It's all that stuff I'm trying to get rid of. Then I can write down the power spectrum here, and it looks like this. We've seen this expression before. And so I need to take a, this expectation value. Because everything's Gaussian, this expectation value is just given by this exponential of the two-point function. And this two-point function I can just write out in terms of a zero lag piece and a piece that depends on separation. So we've been through this before. If you go through and do the intervals, you'll find that this zero lag piece is just the smoothing scale, this mean displacement as we wanted. And this sigma squared, if I, if I uh, calculate it, looks like sigma low frequency squared. So the power spectrum looks like this, or the writing it out, it looks like this damping times p linear plus this mode coupling term. Right? So that's a toy model that reproduces the same kinds of effects that we saw in Lagrangian perturbation theory. But all of the integrals are much easier. So now I want to go through and do this not on the final field, but on the reconstructed field. So my S now looks like minus the smoothing times psi linear, because I'm imagining that all the high frequency stuff is multiplied by zero when I smooth it. Right? So the displaced and the shifted fields are generated by fields that look like 1 minus S times psi linear, psi low frequency plus psi high frequency, and minus S psi low frequency. So you can just go and plug all that in. And the reconstructed power spectrum now looks like the difference between the shifted and displaced field squared. So there's a shifted, shifted piece, a displaced, displaced piece, and this cross term. And this cross term turns out to be quite important. And you can just go through and just repeat the exercise I did in the toy model. It really is just a few lines of algebra to write down the shifted, shifted, displaced, displaced, etc. And they just have powers of s or 1 minus s in them. And they have different damping factors, where these damping factors look like integrals of the power spectrum times these smoothing functions. Because right? all the size now have S's multiplied. 
So everywhere you had to do psi times psi, you now do s times s times psi, and so on. So you get all of these expressions. And if you just look at this, the effect of the s of the 1 minus s terms, and the way these damping terms come in, right? Now, rather than damping by e to the minus k squared sigma squared, I'm damping by e to the minus k squared sigma s s squared. When I do this integral, s, of course, cuts off at high frequency, right? So these integrals uh, re reduce your sort of effective sigma down to a number like half sigma. So that explains why the peak's getting tighter and narrower, right? Because these damping terms have been reduced, the smearing that's coming in has been reduced. Now you can go through and do a very similar calculation in the full Lagrangian perturbation theory. Uh, you just have to keep quite a lot more terms um, if things aren't all Gaussian. The damping calculation turns out to be more or less the same as what I just did in the toy model. You get basically the same expressions. And that's not surprising because remember this damping term came from resumming these very simple linear theory terms. And you know, to linear theory order, everything's Gaussian, so that's nice and simple. The uh, mode coupling terms can be slightly more painful. You basically have to do, redo all of the formulae in Max Barra three times. Um, and uh, you know, there's several hundred equations in that paper. Um, but if you go through that, you find that the mode coupling term is also suppressed. Um, just to show you that we did algebra. Uh, this is an expression for the damping damping term taken from uh, this paper, but, but heavily based by, by these papers by Max Barra. So you, know, you get a whole bunch of terms in here with 10, 21, 6, 7, so lots of good factors. Uh, and then you get these terms that, uh, that have various insertions of s and 1 minus s. So you know, q7, 1 ddd uh, is this expression here, where q7 was that formula I showed you several slides back, right? So you get, you fill a pad of paper with, with some algebra, but it's just algebra, he says, having wasted six months of his life on it. Um, so then you can ask, how well does it actually do compared to simulations, right? Truth, as we all know. So this is another plot taken from on this paper here, uh, and I've divided, of course, in, in the theory I can do this, I've divided up, this is the matter power spectrum of redshift zero, the matter correlation function of redshift zero. Um, you've, you've got here the reconstructed field, the non-linear final field, the piece that comes from the shifts, and the piece that comes from the displacements. Right? So you don't care about all of the sub-pieces, all you want to see is that this shifted field, sorry, this, uh, this final field was nice and broad, and when I reconstructed it, it got much sharper, that's what we saw previously, right? And the points are the end body results and the lines are the perturbation theory. So the perturbation theory is quantitatively describing what's actually going on in the full nonlinear problem. So you can see it's quantitatively describing the change in the broadening uh, and it's quantitatively describing the, the shifts. So now you have a theory that tells you what would happen as I change redshift and number density of tracer and smoothing scale and so on. You can optimize uh, this sort of prediction. Um, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. This shows you the sort of decoherence of the initial and final fields, this thing I referred to as the propagator in my last lecture. Uh, and again, there's shifted fields. There's the final field where you can see these things as a linear k-axis, which is why it looks a little bit funny. Um, and this is for bias traces, actually. This is for halos, which is why, uh, due to the definition, it goes above one. It basically goes to the large-scale bias of these objects. Uh, but this is, this is what happens in the final field. You see this decoherence as the uh, correlation between the initial and final field drops away, and this is the reconstruction. Here it is in the simulations, here it is in the analytic theory, so they differ a little bit, but they both agree uh, that the field, the reconstructed field, is much better tracing the initial field than the final field. Uh, and you can even understand to some extent what's causing these differences um, in this theory. And then this out of phase term is also reduced. You have to stare at the equations a little bit to convince yourself of that. This shows the linear theory power spectrum, so this uh, oscillation is dividing out into some smooth bit. Um, there's dash line, you can't tell the different lines here, this dash line is the derivative of this linear theory term, so that's the outer phase piece. The solid line is what comes in in perturbation theory, showing you that you have generated an outer phase piece from your nonlinear coupling. And then the I don't know, short dash line is what happens when I actually do the reconstruction. So you can see I take this solid line and I reduce its amplitude significantly. I don't make it go away completely, but I reduce its amplitude significantly. You can look at the expression to see why that's so. Uh, so I've generated a much smaller out of phase piece than the full nonlinear evolution did. So I've really narrowed the peak and I've really reduced the phase shift, but I haven't reconstructed the initial conditions, but I have reconstructed something 
much closer uh, to the initial conditions. The other thing you can do, and I'll kind of finish up uh, with this, now I have an analytic theory, I can start asking questions like how do things scale with redshift? What happens if I do this with noisy data, right? Suppose I put something in uh, with some given number density and I need to develop what the underlying smooth density field is from this. Well, I need to smooth on some scale. What's the best scale? What does that do? So you, know, you can take this formalism and do all kinds of things, you know, including the effects of shot noise is actually pretty easy. I won't run you through the argument, but it's, it's fairly straightforward to do. Um, and you, know, you do get a slight change in the mode coupling term, but the largest effect is changing the damping scale. So all those expressions you saw before that were integrals of the linear theory power spectrum now become integrals of the linear theory power spectrum plus some no noise bias, right? So now you want to adjust S from what was optimal previously, right? This is, if this is a shot noise term, that's just a constant. So that has power to very, very high K. You want to get rid of some of this power, so you want to adjust your sort of optimal <coughs> scale and so on. So you can go through and ask questions about what's the optimal thing. Uh, the damping terms are a little bit more complicated. Uh, this noise is just one on the bias squared times the number density. And you can also go and look and ask, at what point doesn't it make any sense to add more galaxies? When do I have, when have I got a really good measurement of the large scale field that I need? And adding more galaxies is adding cost with no benefit. Uh, and you can find that these gains saturate around like 10 minus 4 in sort of standard units of voting number densities. Um, and that's something that you know, most of the surveys that are currently doing, you know, sort of next generation VAO, you know, they, they realize this. So they're all at number densities higher than this. And so that indicates that you can still do effective reconstruction. All right, I'm, I'm almost out of time. So let me just stop here um, and, and say that, you know, so we did perturbation theory and various methods for perturbation theory in the first lecture. Here I just gave some examples of how to use it. Uh, in the next lecture, what I will do is spend some time talking about what happens on scales where perturbation theory is completely uh, inappropriate. Okay. okay, comments, questions? So if I'm doing something like lensing, 
or maybe uh, it would be easier to do a galaxy galaxy lensing where I can isolate the galaxy, It'll isolate one piece of it to a finite ratio. <laughs> You're truly talking about something in projection. Right? So, in principle, given infinite signals of noise, I can undo that projection, of course, but I've integrated my oscillatory signal over some broad kernel and thus I've smeared it out. Uh, I mean, one rough way of thinking about it is you have some peak yeah. and it's at a different angular scale of each redshift, right? And then I have some one. So I've gotten something complicated. Um, if I can isolate it to narrow ratio slices, I can do something. The problem with it is, you know, you may be able to, to find it, right? But finding the acoustic peaks being done, right? It's, it's not that interesting measurement. Um, you pay a huge price with the projected statistic that rather than having, you know, k-cubed modes, you have k-squared modes per unit, you know, volume. And so just the mode counting argues against it being a particularly brilliant way of doing this. I mean, if you can do a lensing survey over that region of sky, you've got fantastic multi-minute imaging, good photometric ratios, fantastic control of your telescope. It's really easy to count the galaxies. That signal will be booming and far, far superior to anything you get out of lensing. And if you really understand all your photometric redshifts and everything else, then, then you can just do the VAO in 2D and it will work. Uh, there is another. Uh. Um, so, so maybe you said maybe you explain this, and I, what, I didn't understand. But um, uh, and I'm having a hard time understanding intuitively how different tracers would be, how their VAO um, peaks would be shifted differently. Um, uh, I mean, so how, oh yeah, how different, differently massed galaxies or halos would be. So, um, could you <laughs> explain yeah, that a bit more, um, if possible? Hmm. So, the broad name turns out to be almost independent of the bias of the objects, and that makes sense because that's just flows of galaxies. So this shell, you know, I'm sitting at the center, there's a shell around me of 100 megaparsecs, and then the fact that there's a cluster over here has pulled some galaxies out of that shell and made a broader right? So then the question is, um, has, what has it done in terms of uh, you know, shifting the peak in or out? So um, there's, there's, a, there's multiple different ways of thinking about this, and I don't know if this one helps you or not. Right? But um, the bias of the tracer is basically telling you how much a fluctuation in galaxy number density corresponds to a fluctuation in mass. If I have an over-density here and an over-density there, they will attract each other and there will be a net infall. Right? That net infall is, roughly speaking, the cross-correlation between the density field and the velocity field. Roughly, right? And the relationship between the power spectrum you're measuring and the density field depends on the bias. Right? Uh, there's additional effects due to the fact that the halos occupy special locations. Right? So they don't sum fairly some sense of velocity field. There's a lot of small effects like that. Um, but, but really it is this effect of kind of linear infall, or pairwise infall, or whatever, if you, if you want to think about it think that, much that way. And so these mode coupling terms basically contain this kind of velocity density cross correlation, for example. And I think that was, that was first really highlighted in this paper by Smith, Sheff, and Scott Jamaro in some order, um, who, who showed, and you know, this goes back, it's actually one of those wonderful things in cosmology, it actually goes back to a discussion in people's large scale structure movement. You know, just like all philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato, all of cosmology is a series of footnotes to that. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of amazing that, that you can sort of understand at some level, at least qualitatively, what's going on just from those simple minded arguments. Some more comments? There's another one. I have another question. Uh, you talk about uh, instructing EAO to major uh, uh, any uh, cosmology uh, parameters. Uh, how about uh, uh, make, uh, use the overall, including EAO, uh, power spectrum or uh, correlation function to uh, measure the bulk body one. 
Yeah, so this is, uh, this is a tension that we're seeing more and more in cosmology now, right? That uh, the more the theorists are paid, um, and the better the theory gets, the, the better life is for everyone, because uh, you can use more and more of the data, right? So if I could tell you with, with infinite fidelity the shape of the power spectrum as a function of cosmological parameters, then you could use all of that information, that entire shape of information, right, to measure whatever cosmological parameter you're interested in, whether it be dark energy and distances or, or whatever. So um, it's really a question between sort of systematic error control, by which I mean theoretical systematics as well as observational systematics, uh, and, and statistical error bounds, right? So you can do a much, much better job if you use the entire information in the shape of the power spectrum. You can drop the errors on distances and on Hubble parameters and so on by factors of two, sometimes even more, by using all of those modes, right? Um, but then you have to say that you really understand exactly how different types of galaxies are biased and how that bias evolves in redshift and how it depends on scale and so on at the whatever it is, the percent level, for example, if I'm doing percent level measurement. So the BAO is kind of the, the, the measurement that people more or less agree has the minimum systematics, right? It's the one you get without needing to do too much work. Um, and then the more you learn about the galaxies, the more you improve the modeling, the more information you can add to the pure BAO result. Right? So the BAO result is like the floor, and you can do better. Um, that trade-off is always a hard one, and different, different people draw the line in different places, obviously. Right? There's quite a long history in cosmology of people fitting incorrect theory and, and deriving extraordinarily <coughs> strong but wrong conclusions. So that's why I think a lot of people like this low systematics. Another comment, question? No, then, thank you, Martin.